Good afternoon, everyone. By way of introduction, my name is Hugh Redlock, and I'm director and CEO of the Fry Group here in Singapore. And I'm gonna be your host as we explore an introduction to tax efficient investments. Let me talk you through our agenda for today. So we're gonna start by uh, describing some of the typical tax problems that our clients face on a day-to-day -day basis. And then we're gonna to move to an overview of and an introduction to the types of tax, tax efficient investment tools that we're gonna talk about today. Namely, venture capital trusts or VCTs and enterprise initiative schemes or EIS. Now we wanna take a balanced view of those types of schemes. So we're gonna talk you through both the key risks and the tax benefits of using them and then the final bit of the uh, formal presentation, there'll be some case studies and key takeaways. Finally, we'll have time for some Q&A, which I will manage. A little bit of housekeeping for you. We're expecting the presentations overall to last around about 40 minutes in total, 20 minutes for Q&A. The whole session will be around about one hour in total. I'll just uh, talk you through our speakers for the day. Um, luckily for you, it's not just me doing the talking today. Uh, I've got a couple of subjects, uh, subject experts with me, uh, Claire and Jack. Claire is our head of tax and technical development. She's based down in Worthing. And we've also got Jack Lear, who is our UK financial planning manager. He's based in London. So, before we get started, I've got a panel question for you, which will be coming up on your screens any moment now. Uh, I will talk you through the question, there it is. Uh, it's a pretty simple one. Uh, are you paying more tax? Do you think you are paying more tax as a proportion of your income than you were five years ago? Three fairly simple answers, yes, no, or maybe. We're all on a tax-related webinar, so I'm guessing there won't be too many maybes, but we'll, um, we'll give it a go and see what, see what we get. Feel free to make your choice whenever, whenever you like, and we'll get the answers in a moment. And there we are. Uh, so we've got yes at 60%. No 28, and we have got some maybes for 12%. Um, I don't think that answer is that surprising, given what's happened with the overall kind of burden of taxation, certainly direct action and taxation in the UK over the last five years. Um, but seeing as 60% of you said yes, you've, you've come to the right place. We should be having a good discussion for you today. Um, so let's get into the, uh, into the meat of the presentation. Uh, and as I said a second ago, um, we're gonna start by um, talking through some of the uh, typical tax problems that our clients come across day to day as a, as a little bit of preparation for the overall session. And I'm gonna go through each of those in turn. So firstly, um, you've maxed out your pension contributions in any year or any tax year. What do you do next? Well, remember that the annual allowance, so, so that's the amount that you can put into your pension and uh, may, that's the amount that you can put into your pension in terms of contributions um, and get tax relief on those contributions in, in any tax year is currently limited to £60,000 uh, in, this, in this tax year. Now, that sounds a lot, um, but remember, that annual allowance is the sum of three things. Firstly, the contributions that you make of your own volition in the tax year. Secondly, uh, the contributions that your employer might make on your behalf. And thirdly, the tax relief that you get on both of those elements. So you can probably uh, get the impression that if you are a relatively good earner, then you are gonna hit that annual allowance relatively fast. So what do you do if you wanna optimize your income tax position further? Well, later on, Jack is gonna discuss the EIS product or tax wrapper, uh, and that can attract income tax relief on contributions as well as offer exposure to early stage or venture capital investment 
in a way that is very well diversified. Second typical problem there is, is people with a lot of uh, income in the UK and a commensurately high UK income tax liability. Now, you could have both of those things, uh, but you might not have any net relevant earnings. You might not have any uh, NREs. And, it, and if that's the case, then you can't make any pension contributions and get tax relief on them. But as I said a second ago, there are other tax wrappers out there, apart from pensions, that are tax relieved, notably EIS and VCT. And we're going to explore the use of those today. Capital gains tax events. Now, there are a number of events that can give rise to a capital gains tax liability. This could be uh, individuals that are selling part or all of a business that they're involved in. They could be disposing of a property, or perhaps they're disposing of a different sort of physical or financial asset. Now, at the Fry Group, uh, we can and we do help our clients to manage their capital gains tax returns making sure that they use all the tax reliefs and exemptions that are available to them and using capital, lo capital losses to offset gains where appropriate. But what if the gain that you've made is, is just too big to manage in that way? Or maybe the individual in question wants to defer the gain uh, uh, to a point where they would pay less tax on it. So depending on your circumstances, we can suggest some solutions. Uh, to sort out those sorts of issues. And finally, non-domiciled uh, non individuals with relevant foreign income. Many non-domiciles coming to the UK will use the remittance basis of taxation um, to shelter their foreign income and their foreign, in and their foreign gains from UK tax. But they can end up holding what are called mixed funds offshore. Mixed funds, meaning funds that contain both clean capital from the perspective of, H of HMRC and various types of income related to it, like dividends uh, and coupon income, that is not clean. Now, if a mixed fund like this is remitted to the UK, it can generate an income tax charge of up to 45%. So we're going to suggest some solutions for, for that issue. Uh, that enable these types of funds to be remitted to the UK without generating that income tax charge and also allow them to be moved back offshore if necessary, i.e. retaining their global portability. So quite a few problems that we've uh, run through there, typical tax issues that our clients tend to face. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Jack to discuss the operation of some of the tax investment, uh, uh, tax efficient investment solutions that can help in these situations. So uh, Jack, it's over to you. Thank you, Hugh. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning um, to talk about tax efficient investments. So um, as Hugh mentioned, my, my role in the Fry Group is to oversee, head up the UK financial planning team. Uh, I am myself a chartered financial planner and a fellow of the Chartered Insurance Institute, our professional body. So what I aim to do today is provide you with a, a greater understanding of tax efficient investments. And to do that, I want to cover three key areas. So firstly, why do tax efficient investments matter? Why should we consider these valuable investments in the first place and how can they be implemented within a financial plan and a portfolio. I'll then move on to unpacking tax efficient investments so we're going into a little bit more detail as to what they are exactly and um, the investment credentials and also why these investments actually exist. Why would the government back these investments? Finally we'll look at the risks associated with tax efficient investments and crucially how we manage these risks. Then I'll pass over to our head of tax and technical development, Claire Spinks, who will go into the detail of the tax benefits associated with these tax efficient investments, specifically venture capital trusts and enterprise investment schemes, VCTs and EISs. She'll also then move on to those case studies, which start to bring all of this to life. OK, so without further ado, let, let's move into the this topic of, of why tax efficient investments matter and how they can be Im implemented within your portfolio and financial plan. And um, the question of why is really quite a straightforward one in my, in my view. I'm sure you'll agree. Um, the UK is a fairly high tax environment. So reducing the chunk of investment returns that go towards paying tax ultimately, ultimately means a greater return seen for you. Um, it's about strategic management of taxation and minimizing the tax 
that we end up paying that eats into our returns. After all, why would you want to pay more tax than you need to? Um, of course, there's a caveat to all of that. And there's a good old saying that says you must never let the tax tail wag the investment dog. And that's that's really true. And what we mean by that is we shouldn't be blinded simply by um, simple or certain tax benefits um, to dictate how we create a financial plan and portfolio. It's important, yes, but needs to be looked at within the context of a financial plan. And that moves me on quite nicely to, to what I mean by that. Taking that 40,000 foot view to understand the financial plan is really, really important to making good investment decisions, be that into conventional investments or to tax efficient investments. So to illustrate this point, what I wanted to do is talk through our, our five steps of financial planning, but draw parallels with um, the process of, of building a house and building a home to, to really bring home that understanding. So I suppose in my in my analogy, what I'm looking to do is, is draw parallels with that, that house building process. And in the analogy, the bricks and material that one would use to build a home and construct a home are, are, are akin to the tools that we have at our, our disposal as financial planners, such as tax efficient investments. Now, imagine you're going through this process of, of building a home. I'm sure you'd agree with me. It would be quite unusual to go to the builder's merchant, select all of the nice bricks and materials that you like in some sort of quantity, go back to your plot of land and just start constructing a home. The probability of, of building uh, the home of your dreams is, is probably quite unlikely. I think far better that you engage with an architect to try and build a blueprint for that home and that house that you want to create. And really, that's that's akin to the financial planning process. So step number one would be to engage with an architect, engage with a professional who's probably going to ask you some fairly unusual questions or seemingly unusual questions because you're keen to build a house. And they'll be asking you things like, you know, can you can you talk me through how you like to live your life? How do you like to spend time in your home? Um, are you outdoorsy? Do you have family? Do you entertain? Do you have dogs? And, and of course, what the architect's looking to do through this process is, is try and draw, understand and paint a picture of the life that you like to live. And in so doing, then create a home and a space that will enable you to live that life. You know, and that is really similar to the, the step one in our financial planning process, which is to understand you and your family. So, so once we've got that, that picture and understanding, we can then start to put some meat on the bones and we can start to build a financial plan that puts you in a position to, to achieve your financial goals. And that's exactly what an architect would do. And they would possibly also bring in some technical specialists as well, I'm thinking the structural engineers to make sure that that plan is robust. And funnily enough, that's very similar to what we do in financial planning. We will bring technical experts to the table at the right time, such as tax specialists or estate specialists to ensure that that financial plan is robust and lasts um, for the long term. Then we get to the part of starting to select the material, the bricks, the, the fixtures and fittings, the tiles that go into building our house. And, and that's stage three and four. That's the investment strategy and looking at the tax efficiency. Finally, of course, as, as we all know, you know, houses need maintenance. It's really important that we maintain our assets. Otherwise, they're not going to last. And, and that's exactly what we do in financial planning. We want to monitor and review because, quite frankly, life changes, ebbs and flows. And what was right for you last year might not be right for you this year. So really important that we review the plan that we created and constructed um, for you previously. So I hope that makes sense. And I hope that provides some context as to, to how we would look at this from a financial planning perspective to assess whether a tax efficient investments form part of that strategy or not. Um, I think the lesson learned really here is that, you know, we, we don't just we don't just buy, we don't just buy bricks. We're not picking bricks. What we're doing is constructing a strategic financial plan and then choosing the right tools and materials to go into to bringing that that plan to life. OK, so now that we've got that sort of 40,000 foot view, let's go into a little bit more detail about what tax efficient investments actually are and some of their investment credentials. So what are they? What are we talking about here? Well, it's a really broad spectrum, um, tax efficient investments. That there's a lot of them. And, and we want to focus today on enterprise investment schemes and, and venture capital trusts, so EIS and VCT. But just for context, 
we've got this array of tax efficient investments available to us, some of which I think will be very familiar to you. And I think it's useful just to break these down into a couple of, of se segments so we can draw differences and differentiate between the two. The first ones being ISAs, pensions and bonds. And this, these are really what we would call tax wrappers. They are, they are tax um, wrappers because what they do is they look to almost put a jacket around otherwise conventional um, investments and by doing so gain certain tax benefits. So both ISAs, pensions, bonds and the other VCTs and EISs have special tax status. It's government, government backed. It's in primary legislation um, and those special tax benefits are delivered with ISAs and pensions and bonds through providing this jacket. The difference being with VCTs and EISs is, is that the investment, the tax efficiency comes directly from those investments themselves, so from VCTs and EISs. So ISAs, pensions and bonds, tax wrappers, they're going to be familiar to you, they're conventional, and they tend to form the core of a financial plan. The other interesting point around the ISAs, pensions and bonds that differentiates them from the VCTs and EISs is that you would typically invest in public markets and publicly listed companies. So very, very familiar names to you, things like Meta, Twitter, I think X, is it X now? Um, Shell, BP, these are the public markets of very conventional, big names, big companies, um, and you would typically get exposure to those through your ISAs and your pensions and your bonds. Conversely, in the VCT and EIS space, you're getting exposure to private markets. So small British companies that are unquoted and they're early stage. And that's really interesting and really important for, for, for a couple of reasons and brings us ni nicely into some of the investment criteria. So the reason this is interesting is because if we look at this graph on the bottom left, behind, just below the public companies table, you can see sort of the typical life cycle that one might expect from a company as it goes from very early stage on the, on the left in startup through um, or scale up startup or the scale up going through this rapid growth and maturity. And these public companies are very much in this maturity phase. And in that maturity phase, you could expect a lower return, a lower growth rate. Whereas private companies, because they were investing in this much earlier stage, you have this opportunity to take part in this much higher, this much more rapid growth journey at the start of the, the, the company's life. So, so that gives us some slightly different investment return profiles. Um, the other thing to consider here, public companies and, and public markets and private companies can perform differently in the same market conditions. So in other words, one can zig whilst the other zags. And that's really important from a diversification perspective, something I'm sure you've heard financial advisors um, talk about in the past. So I suppose just to, to summarize that public companies, you're, you're gaining exposure to typically through your ISAs, your pensions, your bonds, they're mature companies and, and big, well-known names. VCTs and EISs give you a different exposure to a different part of the market into smaller British companies. And because of that, you have this opportunity to partake in this much um, higher growth um, phase of the company's life cycle. Um, a common question we get asked is, is why, uh, why the government would support this type of investment? Why would the government um, assign special tax, tax status, which Claire will go on to explain shortly, to investing in, in smaller companies? And, it, and it's a really, really good question. There are a couple of answers, one couple of points, I suppose, to answer this question. One more generic to investing and saving itself and the other more specific to VCTs and EISs. So, so firstly, it's just important to, to realise that tax is a really, really good way to drive behaviour. Um, so the government can use tax as a lever to drive behaviour. And the behaviours that the government's looking to drive here are twofold. Firstly, um, is to build or encourage saving and investment. So encourage the population to invest and save because that can, dr that can drive and build wealth and that can build resilience in the population and lower the reliance on the state. So that's, that's a good thing from the government's perspective. The second point specifically with VCTs and EISs is that you're driving investment into UK PLC. 
Um, so what's that mean? Well, we, we we as investors in VCTs and AISs are placing venture capital into these companies. That's going to drive employment. It's going to create a, another revenue generating um, aspect for the, the government in, in tax from those companies. We're also going to be driving productivity um, and all of that comes together to build GDP. So it's a really, really important pillar in, in UK PLC. OK, um, so I think at this point it, it's worth just spending some time to consider and look at some of the risks associated with, with EISs and VCTs and also crucially how we would then go to manage those risks. So. Both VCTs and EISs are considered a higher risk investment from, from a financial planning perspective. And that's because you are investing in early stage businesses. And, and anybody that's that's been involved in business and tried to start business knows that the, the success rate is, is not always that high. So we, when we talk to fund managers, we often hear this principle of a third, a third, a third. And what they what they mean by that is within their portfolio of, of investments in smaller companies, they, they fully expect a third of those companies not to succeed. And they expect a third of those companies to do okay, and the other third to really drive the growth in the portfolio. So inherently, we know that investing in smaller companies is, is higher risk. And that's important because when we're doing financial planning, we've got to ensure that when we're providing invite, advice to invest in smaller companies, VCTs and EISs, that that individual is aware of that risk, has the capacity to be able to absorb that risk should things not work out, um, and also has the right attitude towards risk, e.g. this stuff's not going to keep you up at night, because what we all really want is financial peace of mind. OK, um, so the key risks then, in, in my view, would be capital loss, liquidity, time horizon, and legislative. And they offset the opportunity for that higher return from the higher growth potential and this diversification benefit. So, so what exactly do we mean? I mean, capital loss, fairly self-explanatory and linking back to that third, third, third rule that we often hear fund managers quote, um, it's possible that a portion of those smaller companies do not make it. And that means you're going to lose your original investment, either all of it or part of it. And we need to acknowledge that. Liquidity, well, what does that mean? It just means it's not so easy to buy and sell. We know intuitively stock markets, the global stock markets, the public markets trading in large, large volumes every day. We can buy and sell things at the you know the drop of the drop of the hat. But these are less liquid. You know, it, it's a bit more like trying to sell your house. It's less liquid. It doesn't sell as quickly. It doesn't mean it's a bad asset. It's just a characteristic of that asset. It doesn't it doesn't buy. We don't buy and sell so quickly. Um. Time horizon, we need to acknowledge that these investments are longer term investments, that typical time horizons for VCTs and EISs um, are prolonged and, and VCTs minimum really five years and EISs seven to 10 years. So we've got to build that into to our plans and what we want to use our, our money and wealth for. Finally, legislative. So there's tax status and benefits associated with these investments, which Claire will go into the detail of shortly. Um, and this has been around for, for a number of decades now for EISs and VCTs. So there's been led some consistency or lots of consistency from a legislative perspective, but we don't have a crystal ball and we're not in control of what future legislation may hold. You know, it's our view as a house that for the reasons that I've explained about why these exist and why the government backs these, it would be highly unusual or highly unlikely that, that the tax status and benefits would change for EISs and VCTs. But it's 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 still a risk that's worth noting. Um, so how do we go about managing these risks? Well, well, capital loss, let's start there. First of all, we outsource our investment management into VCTs and EISs to the best in class asset managers in these areas, the experts in their field. What we do is we have a very robust due diligence process that sits behind our investment committee to ensure that the best in breed fund managers are the ones that the advisors, your advisors would recommend to you. So that's step number one. We look at the whole of market and we filter it down to what we consider best in breed fund managers. Now the fund managers themselves being experts in 
smaller companies, not only in selecting smaller companies, but also engaging with these smaller companies. They take an active role on the board of these companies to guide, help and support them because it's in their best interest to ensure that these companies succeed. So they bring expertise to the table to these smaller companies. Um, what they will also look to do is back companies over successive fundraisers. So once they've identified a company that they like, that they believe gives the opportunity for higher growth because they're bringing a great service or product to market, um, they will then set goals. And once those goals are met and those, met and those hurdles are met, they will then give additional fundraising um, and capital along the, the journey of those companies all the way through to exit. So that's one way or a couple of ways that the, risks is the risk is managed from a capital loss perspective. The other one, again, quite intuitive, diversification. We would want to see you have exposure to a number of fund managers. Um, and that's the sort of the financial planning um, route there. Liquidity and time horizon, these are somewhat linked. So I've just explained that they're less liquid as an asset class and therefore we've got to be more cognizant of how long our money is going to be invested in these um, investments so we've got to ensure that you've got a sufficient time horizon e.g that you can afford for that money to be tied up in those investments for for a prolonged period of time and long enough so that you don't you're not in a position where you have to sell early potentially losing tax benefits or selling at an inopportune time and realizing crystallizing losses the, the legislative side, as, as we've said and touched on, you know, we're only considering investments here that have been backed for success, over successive governments over decades. So the, the chance of there being legislative change for EIS and VCTs, we perceive to be very low in the first place, but again, to be cognizant of. So I suppose in conclusion there, we will have great potential to invest in companies that can have high growth. And, and companies that you might not have heard of yet, but you may hear of in the future. And there's some great examples that have come out of, of EIS and VCTs, companies like Zoopla, Depop, Kazoo, LeCol, for anyone who's into cycling, um, to name but a few. But on the flip side of that, we do need to be cognizant of the risk. How do we manage those risks? Well, broadly speaking, we want to construct a robust, bespoke financial plan that selects the right investments for you to, to increase the probability of you achieving your financial goals and success, whatever that may look like. OK, with that said, I think it's time for us to get into the detail of some of these tax benefits that we've alluded to throughout. So without further ado, I will hand over to our in-house tax expert, Claire Spinks, to talk through some of those tax benefits and also share some real life examples um, to illustrate how we can implement these and really bring all of this to life. So over to you, Claire. Thanks, Jack. So as Jack said, before we get into those examples and how we might solve those sort of big um, tax issues with these products, let's just run over what the tax benefits are gonna be if you're choosing to look at making an investment. So I think starting off with perhaps the sort of the more simpler of the two, and that's the venture capital trusts. Really the headline for this investment is if you were to make an investment, you're going to get an immediate 30% tax relief or tax reducer. And that's going to stay in place ultimately if you end up holding that investment for five years. And currently we're seeing that investment limit to be £200,000, so, so, quite, so quite low. One of the other income tax benefits of a VCT would be that the dividends are tax free. So any return that you're seeing in the form of a distribution um, from that investment, you're not going to pay tax on. And the last is the capital gains tax side. So when that investment comes to be sold, if you are looking at making a gain on that investment, that gain is going to be exempt from capital gains tax again, if you have held it for five years. So moving on to EIS then, and you'll be able to see the sort of comparison on screen, you'll immediately see that EIS perhaps has a lot more to offer in terms of tax benefits. So again, looking at the income tax relief first, we're looking at 30%, but unlike VCT, you actually only need to hold that investment for three years to permanently benefit from that in income tax relief. The investment, really, uh, investment limit is also substantially higher at two million pounds per annum. So it really might benefit those really high, higher rate taxpayers, perhaps those that have got a lot of income. 
We can also carry back under EIS, which is something that we don't see with BCT. So perhaps if you're making a really substantial investment, but you're not going to be able to relieve all of that tax in the year of the investment, you can carry back and do so into the earlier tax year. So similarly with VCT, EIS does offer what we refer to as disposal relief. So that ability not to pay tax on any gain that you've made from that investment. And again, we're looking at a three year period for that. Now, one of the added benefits in terms of CGT that the EIS investment sees is something called deferral relief. And that is the ability where someone makes a gain and that gain can be on anything, you know, a property or perhaps another share sale, a, share, a sale of a business, is the ability to take that gain and freeze it, essentially attach it to the new EIS investment that has been made, thereby really delaying that tax payment of that capital gains tax. And I think people quite like that idea because it almost takes a bit of cash flow back um, from HMRC and gives you the benefit of perhaps having that capital gains tax in your pocket for a little bit longer. So in terms of um, EIS, Jack talked obviously about the risks and the possibility that, that some absolutely do fail. But with EIS, um, in comparison to VCT, one of those benefits is seen to be that the loss relief. So after calculating perhaps a loss that has been made on the perhaps the failure or sale of that EIS investment, that loss can actually be offset against income tax as well. And we'll cover that in an example a little bit later on. So the last really headline benefit of an EIS investment is that inheritance tax relief and something specifically called business relief. And what business relief does is if someone were to looking at perhaps your death estate or lifetime gifts is reduce the value of that asset in the estate and reduce it by 100 percent. So if someone was to make a qualifying EIS investment after two years, whilst they're still going to hold that investment, we would expect really that that's not going to have an impact from an inheritance tax perspective. So moving on now to business investment relief. So business investment relief is not one of the advertised benefits of an EIS investment. It's actually a, it's a relief completely in its own right. But what we tend to see is that with business investment relief, there is a requirement to be making an investment into a qualifying company, a target company, as is referred to in the legislation. And what we see is that actually EIS um, companies and these target companies that referred to are very similar. And in some, some cases, exactly the same. And it might be the case then making an EIS investment, you could actually look to claim business investment relief at the same time. Now, business investment relief is, is not going to apply to everybody. It's going to apply to non-UK domiciled individuals that have at some point made a remittance basis claim. And as he was explaining at the beginning, if you are such one of those individuals, you're going to have a pot of money sitting overseas, which we would refer to as a mixed fund. But, you know, I've heard being referred to as sort of bad money before or unuseful money. And that's because if you are to bring it into the UK, you are going to suffer an additional tax charge. And what business investment relief allows you to do is it allows you to make that remittance, but without incurring that additional tax charge. So a real benefit for there if somebody's got that pot sitting overseas. So now we start to look at the scenarios, we move on to those scenarios and those big problems that Hugh outlined at the beginning and how we might use some of those investments to help us. So if we look at scenario one, um, we have Claudia, Claudia is married, she's in her 50s. And we would see Claudia as being perhaps the example of somebody that had already exhausted their ISA allowance, um, perhaps their pensions, and maybe looking towards retirement and looking to see that they're set up as, as best as they can be. So Claudia has got an annual salary of £300,000. Um, and she understands that she's got spare income that she's looking to invest. And after having a discussion with her financial advisor, 
she decides that she's going to start to make annual investments of £30,000 a year, you know, with some of this spare income. Um, and she's going to get various benefits from that. So what immediately she's going to start to see is a, a £9,000 income tax reducer that's going to be paid back to her when she completes her tax return. And when those dividends start to be paid, she's also not going to have a requirement to declare those in her tax return. They're going to be tax free. So it's quite a nice way of Claudia to start uh, topping up her tax free income in addition to her ISAs. So over a five year period, what we've seen is that we've seen Claudia invest around £150,000 into various VCTs. And she's received £45,000 in income tax savings for doing so, in addition to those tax-free dividends, however, however much they might have been. And we're coming to, the, coming to the end of that fifth year, and we're looking at that year one investment, so that original £30,000 that was made and received that £9,000 tax relief. And at this point, Claudia is faced with various options. So she knows if she were to sell the VCT, she's outside of that five year window. So there's no clawback for her from an income tax perspective, but also any gain that she might have made is gonna be free of capital gains tax. So she might choose to do that and invest the money elsewhere. She might choose to retain that VCT. There's no requirement for her necessarily to sell that, especially from a tax perspective. She might be very used to those particular tax free dividends that she's been receiving. Or she might decide actually to sell the VCT and buy more. So reinvest those proceeds, whatever they end up being, and receive that additional 30% tax relief on doing so. But say quite a simple example there for Claudia and um, how you can make you know, VCT help you from a, a tax benefit perspective, not just on the relief, but also on the future income. So if we move now to scenario, Two. Scenario two is a little bit more complicated. We've now got the case of Will, and we would see Will as of one of those clients of having a CGT event that perhaps he's got to pay the capital gains tax out on, and also at the same point being a high earner, so an additional rate taxpayer. So in 23 to 24, the year that we're in currently, Will has a buy to let property sale, and he's made gains of £200,000. You know, and after a chat with his tax advisor, he knows that that's going to cost him £56,000 to HMRC that he's going to have to part with in a year or so. And unfortunately for Will, he knows that feeling of parting with tax all too well because he made a gain in 21-22 from another property sale of £100,000. And he's already paid that £28,000 to HMRC over. So that's money that's not in Will's bank account any longer. So again, after a review with his advisor, what Will decides to do is that he's going to make an investment of £400,000 into a wide range of EIS investments. So what is that going to mean for Will on doing so? Well, the first thing is that Will is going to see income tax relief of up to £120,000. And he might choose not to make the claim in the 23-24 year, but he might use some of that to offset against the previous year's tax liability. He, of course, has got his uh, £300,000 capital gains over those two years, and he's going to choose to use that CGT deferral relief to shelter those. So in other words, those capital gains are going to attach to some of the EIS investments that he's made. And those, those capital gains liabilities are therefore not going to become payable until such time that those EIS investments might be sold or fail. Um, so not only is he not going to have to pay that sort of £56,000 to HMRC in the coming year, but he's actually going to be able to reclaim that £28,000 that he has already made. One of the added benefits for Will is if, you know, two year period, he's also going to see that business relief. From, any, um, from an inheritance tax perspective. So let's fast forward to 2526. And sadly for Will, £100,000 of those EIS investments that he's made have actually failed. But because they failed, he's not going to receive any clawback of that £30,000 of tax relief that he would have received on that amount, regardless of it being within that three year period. 
So Will is keen to understand that whilst he's lost that hundred thousand pounds, what has he actually lost in in overall? You know, when we consider the tax effect that it had as well. So we've taken that hundred thousand pounds and we've immediately reduced it by that thirty thousand pounds that he received in income tax relief. So we're sort of looking at a, a genuine seventy thousand pound loss. And what Will can do is he can offset that seventy thousand pounds against his taxable income. We know him to be an additional rate taxpayer, so that saved him another 45%. So on that £100,000, his actual monetary loss is £38,500. The other point to note is because of the, the failure of that £100,000, we've seen any of those gains that were deferred onto the part of that investment come back into charge within 25, 26. And Will would have to pay the capital gains tax rates on it at that time. But if he would choose to, he could also choose to make further EIS investments and again, freeze those gains until a future event. So we fast forward to 3031 for Will now, so well outside that three year investment period. And he started to see those remaining EIS investments of 300,000 pounds they've started to mature. He's actually managed to sell them for 600,000 pounds. So those, again, those gains that he deferred originally have come back into charge. He could choose to delay them further. But that gain of 300,000 pounds that he's made on the EIS investments themselves are tax-free because we wouldn't see that with another type of investment. He's also maintained that 120,000 pounds of income tax relief. But we, of course, must know that there was a loss on part of £38,500. So moving on to then our last scenario before we hand back to Hugh, um, we have Bernard. And Bernard is our, is our non-UK domiciled individual. He's been a remittance basis user and he's got that pot of money sitting outside their UK, that uh, mixed fund. And in his case, it's £500,000. And he'd like to have some use of that money in the UK, but he understands from his tax advisor, because perhaps because of the ways that it's structured, it's really not going to be very easy to get his hands on any clean capital. And he's ultimately going to face a tax charge if remitted to the UK, and perhaps as well some costly fees in analysing what is sitting within that mixed fund. So Bernard remits to the UK £100,000 of that money. He's very aware of all of the rules around business investment relief and what he must do to make sure essentially that that remittance can be ignored at this time for income tax, possibly capital gains tax purposes. So within 45 days of that remittance, he subscribes for shares in a qualifying target company. And that target company is also qualifying as well for EIS relief. That was something very important to Bernard. And so he's ensured that his tax advisor and his financial advisor are working together to making sure that both reliefs can be secured for him there. So on that remittance of £100,000, yes, it's been bought into the UK, but because of those business investment rules, he is not going to suffer a tax charge on that. But he's also actually going to get the benefit of that income tax relief. So he's going to see £30,000 being available to him. And that doesn't need to be moved outside the UK. That absolutely can remain in the UK. He is going to have capital gains tax deferral relief available to him. So this might not be relevant at this time, but he might see that that's something that he could benefit for in the near future. So four years later on for Bernard, those investments start to be sold. They have a gain themselves. And that gain can remain in the UK. It's just going to be really important for him that he's going to move the money outside of the UK within those permitted limits or perhaps reinvest them again into something that would qualify. So that's really just an example of so people, you know, very common to have a mixed fund, but it's not necessarily sort of lost money or money that has to be used overseas. These two reliefs do really work quite nicely together. So after sort of summarising those, I'm now going to pass back to Hugh. He's going to look at questions and some key takeaways. 
Well, thank you very much for that. So um, let me summarize the key takeaways from the, uh, from the formal part of the presentation today, and then we'll move on to Q&A. Um, so firstly, you know, hopefully we have shown that there are advantages to having all of your advisors in one place if they're able to provide that, um, that holistic approach. If you know, we find we can generate optimal client outcomes, if, for example, tax advisor recognizes uh, when a financial planner is required and vice versa. Secondly, timing is really important when it comes to taking advantage of some of these tax opportunities. Um, you know, both the opportunities and the time um, to capitalize on them can be finite. Um, so timing is very important. Thirdly, uh, earlier stage capital can have real benefits as part of a balanced approach to your financial planning. Investing in public markets is absolutely core to building your wealth, but earlier stage capital can, can really play a part, both from an investment and obviously a tax perspective. And finally, there are a range of government-backed, credible tax-efficient investments that are available. And yet in, in fact, EIS and VCT are looked upon in a, in a benign fashion by the revenue because they perform a very important function channeling funds into early stage business in the UK. So um, now we've got time for some questions and questions and answers. Um, Jack and Claire, if I can ask you to put your screens back on uh, if you haven't already. Uh, and we've got quite a few questions um, coming in. Please feel free to carry on putting them into into the question box on on Zoom because we've got a we've got a bit of time over the next ten minutes whilst whilst we cover this off. So, um, first question then uh, I'm going to pose this one to Jack and to Claire. Um, and the question is: with EIS having so many more tax benefits than VCT, why should someone consider VCT? Claire, do you want to take that one first? Yeah, sure. I mean, it, it certainly does, but I would say that perhaps not everyone needs all of them. Um, now, Jack talked about from a risk perspective, and I, you know, he will probably touch on that again in a second. Um, but I would say, you know, they, they can achieve different things. They have the same rate of income tax relief available to them. Perhaps EIS is not as favourable if you've got a gain that you want to defer. But equally, if you haven't, actually, those tax-free dividends might be you know far more important for you so i think it depends what you need from it really is would be my answer yeah just just to build on that really um there, there are slight nuances between the two investments so with a vct um you would typically get exposure to companies who are further on in their journey so slightly later stage and because they're slightly later stage, they're, they're what we call post revenue and in positive cash flow territory. So they're in a position to be able to provide dividends. And those dividends could form a really key part in, in providing a tax free income stream within your financial plan and, and your, your income needs. So, so that would be one key reason as to why. Okay, thank you, guys. Um, I think we'll all have a have a go at this one. Perhaps Claire, you can you can go first. Um, so we've got um, we've got someone saying um, I'm I'm considering e uh, investment into EIS and VCT, but I'm concerned with the intricacies, administrative complexity, and the overall security of the, of the investment. Um, I'd be interested to get the panel's thoughts on the matter. So just as a as a recap, the intricacies of the admin complexity involved in the security of the investment. Yes, yeah, so I think I can certainly comment from the sort of admin complexity side of it. Um, so that's probably one of the downsides that we see from a, from a tax side um, about EIS as opposed to VCT, actually, in that because you're more likely to invest in so many more companies to get that diversification, you are likely to receive multiple um, green EIS forms at various times. So there is a clearance procedure for that investment. And what we sometimes see is that, you know, there can be a little bit of a time lag on receiving, you know, confirmation that that investment has been successful from an EIS perspective to go in your taxes. 
Now, I suppose as tax advisors, we're really used to dealing with that. You know, we've got a lot of sort of tools that we use to really ensure that not only are we making sure that everything that's being claimed where it can in terms of income tax relief, okay. that we are also really reviewing from a CGT perspective, you know, what year is best to make certain claims and monitoring that moving forward um, from a loss perspective. And again, making sure that we are capturing all investments and making sure that you're getting the tax relief. So I would say certainly from that perspective, if somebody has got a tax advisor and they're happy that those things are being done from them, that's going to take a lot of the that admin complexity away from them. Brilliant. Thank you, Claire. Jack, any, any, anything you want to add there um, on that point? Yeah, I, I think just building on the the, the sort of the um, the point around, I, I suppose, risk, really, the sort of security, I forget the, the exact wording, but um, it, it, whoever asked that question, you're thinking on exactly the right lines to be considering that. And when we go through the process of constructing a financial plan, we want to keep things as simple as possible. And, and these are certainly more sophisticated investments. They come with additional complexity and you would only look at them once you've built that and utilized your, you know, the core elements of your financial plan, your pensions and your ISIS in particular. Um, so keeping things simple is really important. And if you are concerned of that, ab about the complexity and the level of security, then, you know, engaging with a firm and, and taking professional advice will, will really help um, manage those risks. Um, I touched on it during my part of the presentation around the government governance that sits behind bringing together a panel of VCT and EIS providers. The market is very, very sophisticated. It is mature. There are a lot of providers out there and there are, there's high discrepancies between um, the good and the not so good. So, so we really want to make sure that we're selecting good, solid fund managers in the first place. And there are a whole load of metrics that sit behind our decision making, both quantitative and qualitative. Um, so I would say those two, two points, you know, keep things simple if you possibly can, engage with a professional, um, because there is a robust governance framework that sits behind bringing these products um, to, to your portfolio. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, next question. Um... I'm not UK resident, but I have a lot of income arising in the UK. Can I still use one of these solutions? Now, given that I'm sat in Singapore, I think I'll, I think I'll take this one. Um, so um, we do see um, clients who are not resident in the UK, certainly using EIS to, to, to a reasonable degree. Uh, and the, the reason why we do on the whole is because those clients have quite a lot of income uh, that is being generated in the UK. And they want to try and um, optimise their UK income tax position, even though they're in a position where you know, they can't make any pension contributions that are tax relieved. So typical sort of client scenario here is perhaps someone who is resident um, outside of the UK. Perhaps they have a, 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 lot, a large residential property holding. It's generating a lot of rental income. Uh, and they want to try and get some income tax relief to optimize that tax position. So that's just one one scenario. But but typically for non-residents, it's it's people who've got significant um, income being generated in the UK. Um, obviously, your capital gains tax liability drops away after five years um, being non-resident anyway. Um, so it's less relevant. But certainly from the perspective of income tax mitigation, that's quite important. So um, next question, um, and this is very much around due diligence and, and the, the due diligence that we do in this market. Um, Jack, that's something that you've, you've talked about quite a bit already. Anything you sort of want to add around, around the actual process that we go through to get to the managers that we use in this space? Yeah, certainly a bit more meat on the bones if you'd like. Um, so our first stage is to to outsource the initial phase of due diligence to um, a, a a firm who specialise in this this particular market. So they're an independent firm that we pay for research independently to assess and appraise the entire market, and we provide that research company with a number of criteria from which they construct their advice to us on on a panel. Now that that panel will then go to our investment committee. And we would then appraise the merits of the individual fund managers who are being put forward to that panel. That would then go into us 
forming a, a panel for our advisors to select from. So, so when our advisors come to you to provide advice, they have a pre-selected um, panel to, selected from the whole of the market that we consider to be best in breed. So that's that's the the core of the process. And it's worth noting that that gets reviewed um, annually. So the panels are continuously renewed. Yeah, and I've certainly seen some some very good results come from that. So um, so thank you for that. Um, I'm cognizant of time. We'll have we'll have one more question, and um, Claire, this one's this one's for you. Um, so the the question the question is um, we we've got a we've got a client um, who is thinking about trying to sort of utilise business relief um, to to mitigate part of a UK inheritance tax liability, and they're wondering. Um, which wrapper they should be considering? Is it ES? Is it EIS? Is it VCT? And and um, if so, why? Yeah. So it would have it would have to be EIS. Um, you, I think, equally there are other products as well that qualify for business relief without it necessarily um, being an EIS. You can get those standalone products, um, but it, it's really useful, I would say, for that tool. Um, again, it might be a reason why we see people that are perhaps outside of the UK, you know, they're non-resident, but perhaps they've got that UK domicile still. So very much within the scope of UK inheritance tax and looking perhaps at later life, I would say, when more traditional planning um, might, might fail them. Um, and absolutely, that's something that we would really sort of commonly suggest and talk through with a client because they've only got that sort of two year period from investment to secure that really big, that 100% relief within their death estate. And they can also utilize that by lifetime gifting as well. So after having held that investment, if they choose to, to push that on, it's potentially gonna mitigate some of those potentially exempt transfer rules that we see for inheritance tax. So I think certainly worth having a discussion with tax advisor or financial advisor around that, if that was something you were looking at doing. Fantastic. Thanks, Claire. Um, so I'll take the opportunity to say thank you very much uh, to, you, to you both for your, uh, for your participation today. Um, and, um, and we'll close the session with a little bit of a reminder um, about the Fry Group itself. Uh, we are a UK headquartered tax, financial and estate planner. Uh, we were formed in 1898. And, and as the, you can see the map in front of you here, in terms of uh, our, our current locations across the globe. Um, we, we have quite a lot of ambition to, uh, to grow this out, but this is, this is currently um, where we're sat. Um, our mission, if you like, is uh, to help our clients achieve financial freedom. We appreciate that this means different things to, to different people, um, but that's, uh, that, is our, that is our mission in life. Uh, and on the next slide, um, you will see our contact details across the globe. Please feel free to get in touch, even if you just want to know a little bit more about what we do day to day. Uh, so it just remains for me to say, uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much for joining the session. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll talk to you again soon, no doubt. Thank you.